Well, here we all are again. I call this house to order, not that that call was needed, to discuss the motion this house would require immunization of children regardless of religious or philosophical objections. And I now invite the Prime Minister to take the floor uh, and to begin the debate and file the bill which shall bear her name. Yeah. Sorry, I can't remember yeah. saying it. Mr. Speaker, we here on site government recognize the ability of the government to be an arbiter of interest when it comes to two uniquely important positions, such as those of public health and the religious interests that people have within society. That's why we today support the resolution that all children should be Im immunized, regardless of religious or philosophical objections. We would propose the following model, that for all children in liberal democracies to be able to interact with the state, as in receiving a social security card, enrolling in public schools, or any other such interaction, children must have had immunizations or they will, they will be barred from those interactions. We believe that children and parents who don't want to participate in the immunization process haven't earned the ability to interact with the state on this level, and this is their motivation and our enforcement to make sure that they do so. I will be discussing today the primacy of public health over religious objections, just on a philosophical level in terms of societal impacts. Secondly, I'll discuss how the state already limits parental sovereignty, both in terms of child welfare and in religious instances. My partner Josh will then discuss other instances when we err on the side of life as a right rather than religion. Before we get to that, let's discuss the primacy of public health. We believe that because children are in a unique vulnerability of being prone to illness because of the, the weakness of their immune systems as they're developing and growing into adulthood, and because of the fact they are constantly in contact with other people who are also weak in their immune systems and carriers of other diseases, they uniquely are situated to be immunized to prevent long-term damage to their, their bodies and the bodies of others from these diseases. I think that's very important. We don't just have these diseases affect them when they're not immunized. They spread these diseases to other people as they also carry the disease. So for the impact that they don't just bear the, the illness themselves, but are carrying the illness to other people, there's a massive widespread health concern that goes into consideration when it comes to immunization. Public health threats, both at the, the level of children carrying these diseases and, and spreading them to one another and enduring them, and the adults they might infect as well because they do go home to their parents or interact with adults altogether, have many different social costs attached to them. Children themselves can't complete their education very well. They're constantly out of school sick because of these preventable diseases like measles, mumps, rubella, or other such diseases that are commonly immunized from childhood, inhibiting their ability to go through school at, a, at the regular pace which other students do so. Also, this translates into other problems when, when, when children are stalled in their education, they become less likely to actually become functional adults within society and contributing members to society. But when these children also infect other people, such as adults, there's a drain on their ability to properly work and take care of their families. And we think this is very massive because it's not just the religious objection of one person at stake, but the massive health impacts of the entire society as a whole when these diseases spread to a lot of people. The balance of this interest is necessary because we, we do support the religious choices of people. We have to decide where that actually has a limit when it comes to the policies that we, pers we pursue because we don't believe that these types of rights are absolute. We also recognize that children are not the people who are deciding these medical decisions. They aren't, they aren't educated enough to know what they're actually consenting or not consenting to. And often these are the religious will of the parents that are taking place, which we will discuss at length later. We don't think that children should be subjected to diseases that are preventable, and that's the crux of our case today. Before I move on, I'll take your point. So just like you said, it's not decisions that the children are making. Why should we punish children by denying them access to schools and hospitals because of a decision you yourself say is beyond their control? Yes, we have no other mechanism to make adults do this type of action. Because if adults really do want the best for their children, which is what they're doing with this religious objection, they also want them to engage within society by having social security cards and being able to be publicly educated. We can't really bar adults from entrance into society once they've already been entered into it, unless they become felons. But we think that this is the, the best way to we can actually accrue some sort of effect out of this, this policy. So let's talk secondly about how the state already limits parental sovereignty in, in terms of how much control an adult has over their child. We recognize that they are the ones charged with the responsibility of raising their children, and most of them do a good job most of the time, but there are certain limits in terms of how you yourself can treat a child that is in your charge. You cannot physically abuse your child, you cannot work your child, you cannot expose them to harsh labor conditions, and you can't neglect them. You're charged with not only making sure they're protected from harm, but you're also not supposed to enact harm against them. 
we, we see that there's already a precedence of religious objections being overruled by governments and for the interests of the child, such as snake handling religious sects in the South of America, of the United States, not South America, who, who believe that because of a Bible passage, that if they are bitten by snakes or drink rat poison, that the belief in God that they have will save them from death. The state has intervened, taking these children away from these families because they recognize these children are consenting to this action and they are being exposed to an unsafe religious practice. Before I talk about other instances of this, I will take your point. So ma'am, should the state also punish parents who feed their children on a beast diet and make sure they don't get adequate exercise? Yeah. We think that there, that's a, that is a concern that we have in terms of the responsibility that parents bear when it comes to, comes to how much care they take for their children. We recognize it a more immediate concern when it comes to contagious diseases. When it comes to the long-term effects of diet, however, that's a debate for another day. So let's talk about other types of religious objections that we don't see as being warranted, such as Christian scientists who don't take their children to doctors because they believe in faith healing. And because of this, a lot of times the children get sick and aren't given proper medical treatment, they end up dying. And parents are charged with negligent homicide for their children because of actions that they should have been able to reasonably expect would harm their children. And we recognize that people have the right to exercise their faith, but as Josh is going to talk about, the right to exercise your own faith stops when it impedes another person's ability to live or to live well. Meaning this is a fundamental precept in terms of how we how we balance the interests of religious rights within this society and the rights of other people to also live within that society. Because children aren't yet at an age where they can willingly consent to the practices that parents put upon them based upon their own religious beliefs, we recognize that the government has the duty to intervene on behalf of these children and make sure that they aren't harmed beyond a reasonable level, or not harmed at all. There is no reasonable level of harm we should be inflicting on children at all. And by barring children from getting immunizations that they need in order to grow and live well, these parents are taking upon themselves, because of a religious motivation, a very harmful behavior to these children and causing massive widespread societal impacts when it comes down to the fact that these are contagious diseases that other people can catch if they are caught by even one person. So we've told you today that we have a mechanism at hand that makes sure that if people want to have their children interact with society, they have to make sure their children are healthy enough to interact within that society, meaning there's substantial motivation and enforcement to do so. We recognize that we, we do support the rights of people to practice their religion, but that there's a limit when that practice of religion interferes with other people's lives. And the primacy of public health is certainly one of those instances. And we've seen precedents for state limiting parental sovereignty. It is for all these reasons we are very proud to propose. I thank the lady for her remarks, and I now call upon the leader of the opposition to enjoin the debate. Yeah, here, here. And to join it, I will, Mr. Speaker, quite a verb. I want to talk about what they just said and why this is cruel, inhuman, and I think potentially illegal. I think we have to understand that this is an issue of rights. In fact, sacrosanct human rights, religious rights, and dare I say it, parental rights, because parents indeed do have rights that we ought to respect. I think you heard a lot of things which were really problematic. You heard some POIs which explained to you rather succinctly why they were so problematic. In particular, I'd ask one, which is why punish the child for a decision that side government, in their opening address, themselves acknowledged was beyond their control? We think that's just unethical. We think it's wrong. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later in my reputation, but first, two constructive points. First, I want to talk about the political dimensions of this. I want to tell you why this will cause political alienation and why this wastes political capital in a country like the States. The second thing I'm going to talk about is why this is a human rights issue, a religious rights issue, and a parental rights issue, and why the interests of people who, allow, who need to have rights, such as religious groups and parents, overrule the types of concerns that they're talking about. So first, let's talk about the political ramifications of this. Because let's understand that the people that we're talking about, the people who would like to refuse immunizations, are extremely vehement in their denial of the validity of these immunizations. They take it extremely seriously. These are the kind of things that people get radical and extreme about. And we have to understand that when you say something like, well, it'll change parents' behavior, the question that I have to ask is, will it? Because if you go to these parents, parents with a genuine belief that their children will burn in the fires of hell for all eternity if they let you stick a needle in their arm, and you say, let, can we let, do this to your child, please, we'll let them go to kindergarten, right? They might turn around and say, no. And what happens when they say no? 
They're barred from access to all public services, as you heard under the government model. And so what we would say is when you're in a situation where you have the government sanctioning religious minorities and then barring them access to all public services, that's a recipe for ghettoization and alienation. You're basically saying people with a given religious belief are likely to wind up without any government support at all in any capacity. We think that's incredibly dangerous. We think that it leads people who reject some medicine to reject all medicine. We think it leads some people who reject some government policies and positions to reject all, <coughs> excuse me, wow, all government policies and positions. And this type of alienation and radicalization is extremely dangerous, not least of which for the problems that religious extremists tend to be things like violent, but also very difficult because it perpetuates the very ideologies that we have a problem with. So understand that if they're making choices that we could acknowledge that in some respect are bad, the last thing we want to do is alienate these people further, justifying the choices they've made and lead them to believe that they have no place in a country and a government that doesn't take their beliefs seriously. Yes? Well, this is actually the case in a lot of places with the school board districts, and parents do make the decision to actually still send their children to school because it is coercive. We think this is a way to get rid of the disease. Yeah, I think the word there to emphasize is coercive. I think we have to understand that there is such a thing as undue coercion and there's such a thing as illegal coercion. And that's what I'd like to move on to in my second point about human, religious, and parental rights. Because we have to acknowledge here that this isn't just a question of, is this a good idea for public health? It might be. I don't think it is. And my partner is actually going to give you some very, very specific analysis about why this isn't medically sound from an epidemiological perspective. But more importantly, I don't think that this is legal. I don't think it's legal because humans have an ability to practice religious rights. If we take a country like the United States, a signatory to the Declaration on Human Rights, which promises religious freedom, certainly this extends to their bodies. This is why the government can't bar my parents from getting me a circumcision. They can't do it. I get to have one if I want one, and it's a religious thing, even if it's a totally unnecessary procedure. And unnecessary surgery is usually, in most other capacities, completely illegal. But in those cases, it's not. But more importantly, I think we need to talk about parental rights. Because understand that it was raised on a POI, and I'd like to add to it now, that parents have the right to make choices for their children that may in fact be bad. Parents often, in fact, make choices to have them lead a bad lifestyle, consume bad food, watch bad movies, and live in a bad area of town. But quite unfortunately, it's those parents' rights to do so. And we understand that there are abiding positive reasons why it's important. It's important because a parent has a connection with that child, and a parent has a right to see that their child is raised in a way that they see fit. This allows their parent to, in good faith, pursue what they think is the best interest of their child. And the vast majority of cases means that parents can do the right thing for their child. And we see those rights as being sacrosanct and far beyond the sort of uh, jurisdiction of the types of concerns that we're seeing. So we see here that we have a problem violating fundamental human rights to practice religions. And we see a fundamental human right to raise your child in a way that you see fit. Because let's understand that the abiding health concerns aren't nearly as serious as they might have you believe. Because we didn't hear a single disease that we were talking about. Not one disease that we were talking about. And it's with that that I'd like to turn to my refutation. So first of all, let's take their entire case construct. They said that all children will be denied access to public services. This is an extremely dangerous thing. First, it's cruel, it's inhuman, and I think potentially illegal. I think parents would be right and are likely going to sue to say that being denied access to all public services despite the fact that they're taxpayers and citizens is going to be a fairly significant thing in a country like the States. Moreover, I really want to take on the issue of punishing children for a choice they didn't make because let's understand that if we sanction people, we usually do it in regard to something that they themselves have done. But if the children have never opted into this, and we know that we deny them the rights, our own legal system says that the children don't have sovereignty over their own medical choices till they're 18, then how could we possibly hold them accountable? This all hinges on the idea that we can somehow coerce parents. But what happens to the ones we can't? Because side government surely doesn't like to pretend that all parents will be coerced 100% of the time. What this means is that in at least one case, or probably thousands of cases, the parent will make the choice not to immunize their child. That child will be punished throughout their entire childhood by the state. And that's an extreme punishment that that child never merited because they never chose to do it. Moreover, if we want to talk about public health, the question I would say is, what diseases are we talking about? These aren't kids like showing up with you know, rubella and suddenly giving it to all their classmates. Classmates, who I might add, are already immunized. And we're talking about a vast minority of people, something that my partner will talk more about. But lastly, what I want to ask is, will this change parents' behavior? Because we don't tend to think that it will. We have to understand that the types of groups that we're talking about today are groups that are extremely vehement in their beliefs, that believe quite sincerely and quite genuinely in the metaphysical harms. 
And so it's with that that I'd like to finish. Because we have to understand that the metaphysical harms to those people are indeed quite real. That when they think they're going to go to hell, or their child is going to go to hell, or indeed suffer metaphysically for it, that is absolutely psychologically terrifying for both the child and the parent with that sincere belief that that is the way things are. And those types of metaphysical and psychological harms, though we might acknowledge them as a misapprehension, are certainly real enough to those people. So understand that under the reality of those beliefs, beliefs which are unlikely to change when sanctioned by the government like this, people are going to feel not only that they've been harmed metaphysically, but that they've been alienated by the state. What God has essentially presented to you today is a proposition that would alienate extreme religious minorities, it would deny them access to needed services, it would hurt children materially by providing them no access to hospitals or education, and punish them for a choice that they couldn't possibly have made, and in so doing, denying them basic human rights, religious rights, and parental rights, we beg to oppose. Thank you. Here we go. I thank the gentleman for his enthusiastic in joining, and I invite the Deputy Prime Minister to address the House. I guess what we're forced to do now is to ask which punishment is worse, the punishment of something like polio or rubella or HPV or any of these other litany of diseases, many of which Kelly did mention in her speech, or the punishment of the very minuscule minority of people who will choose not to send their child to school to avoid getting a shot, or who all enter into litigation because it's worth going through years and years and years of a lawsuit to avoid a 30-second pinprick. We don't think that's the case, and we think that that side falls much more on our side than on theirs. Now, Kelly talked about uh, uh, about this, uh, a bunch of stuff that I probably didn't, should have written down so I tagged it better. Um, but uh, I'm going to be talking more about sort of how we see the, the legitimacy of the government to interfere in situations like this. But first, I want to address some points about reputation. Now, they talked about political alienation of the extreme religious minority. And I want to point out that it is the extreme religious minority. But the point is that this is already the status quo. These are people who are already alienated, and that's not going to change no matter what sort of policy that you pass under any circumstances. But the thing is, these people hate the government anyhow, and they still will. But this way, their child might get immunized in the process. So we don't see that as political alienation. We see that as helping children, and we see that as a much better thing. Um, then they talked about how it's going to waste political capital. But they said themselves, it's an extreme religious minority. There's like 16 people who this isn't going to convince somewhere in the South who want to feed their kids rat poison. We don't think that wastes political capital because most people go along with this sort of thing, which is why we've seen policies like this work in the past, which is why you see things like polio man vaccines getting mandated, why you see things like smallpox getting uh, mandated, why even in Texas, one of the most religious places in the country, they allow this. Either Texas or Oklahoma, they made it mandatory that you get an HPV vaccine in order to enroll in high school, and people went along with that. And like 15 people were upset and protested and made like a media storm that lasted about 35 seconds, but then they all went along with it in the end because they realized it wasn't worth the trouble. They did not enter into years of litigation like they tried to tell you. Then they talked about the fundamental human right to practice religion. Here's the thing. We believe the fundamental right of life comes first, because if you don't have the right to life, you don't get the opportunity to practice religion. And that's the whole point of what we're trying to say. We're trying to protect these children's rights so that they have the chance to practice that religion later on, should they so choose. And when that immunization runs out and they choose not to get it again because they want to pursue religious freedom, then that's their thing to do. But when they're age three and they don't have the maturity to address these, I'll get to you right after this, then we don't think that that's a fair position to put them in because it directly threatens their health and their safety and it's absolutely criminally negligent of their parents to do that to them and we don't think that that's something we should be supporting. But you disagree, sir? Yes, these are people who think that a life such as the one you describe isn't a life worth living and condemn them to eternal suffering. My question is this. Clearly rational Why actors. is it fair to hurt these children for a decision that they never had a role in making? Because they're being hurt much worse for a decision that they never had a role in making. That's the whole point. We're saying that we, in their right in the status quo, they are being hurt demonstrably. Under the possibility that you're putting a much smaller percentage of them might get hurt much, much less which means that, that we think that that's something we should support. Apparently you disagree, but whatever, you're the opposition, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> okay, so let me talk about uh, bodily autonomy a little bit. Because this is when you generally see the state intervene on things like bodily autonomy, is when someone is trying to in invade on someone else's bodily autonomy. And in this case, we see that parents are trying to inflict their will upon their children. And we do limit that, which is why Kelly said that we don't allow you to like abuse your children or like chop off their arms or force them to drink rat poison in churches in the South. And we see this as an extension of that sort of thing. Because we see this as an issue of mitigating some harms. 
Yes, we are taking away a very small bit of religious freedom. But as I said, we recognize the right to life having to come first, because without it, these other rights can't exist. And we think that when that religious freedom threatens your life, we have a right to limit it. And we've seen that quite clearly with the intervention of snake handling sex in the South and with things like Christian scientists, where they practice faith healing and then are charged with criminal negligence because their children often die. We think that that's exactly the appropriate action, and this is an extension of that, where we're trying to prevent those sort of things from happening. Before I go on a little further, go for it, Harvard. So do you think these people's right to life might be more affected by the fact that they're shut out of the public health system with their parents' don't you skip the immunization? Uh, no, because here's, what, here's the thing. You're trying to classify it as people are going to go, oh, I have to get a shot. Screw it. I'm never going to bother. I'm going to go live in the mountains and never have a social security card and do all these things. And that's absolutely not true. When seen with what they can, it's a simple cost-benefit analysis. What they can gain by getting an immunization versus the cost and trouble of avoiding it, we think they're going to go with getting the immunization. And we think that that's absolutely fair to say that because ultimately in a cost-benefit analysis, it's much easier to do take a 30-second pinprick than to spend a life without all the access to all of those services. So we think that's not going to happen. Um, moreover, Sorry. like we said, the children don't have a choice in this matter. Uh, they're, uh, they're having these religious views inflicted on them in a way by their parents who don't, uh, are, who are, because they're not mature enough to understand these things on their own. Like we said, they can refuse it later on their own, and that's great. Um, and we do have a long history of the government interfering in religious issues when we see it as going too far. I want to point out some examples of that. Like, we don't uh, allow Satanists to sacrifice people, things like that, which may be part of their religious practices. We don't allow them to sacrifice animals either for the same reasons. The point is we see this as being uh, going too far and do limit that. We also see the government intervene in things like polygamist cults and uh, pedophilia and incest. They just broke up a big uh, Mormon ring somewhere in the, in the woods a couple, a couple days ago. It was all over the headlines. What, um, then you see things, and we also intervene in things like cults and brainwashing, and we see this is the same kind of thing. When religious freedom goes too far and inflicts itself on the rights of children to live a normal, healthy life, then really the government does step in and take some sort of action, but clearly you just think that that's a problem. Okay, feeding your kid rat poison is murder. Not feeding your kid Yes, and you know what? Denying your child alive. medicine or access to a doctor is also murder, which is why these people get charged with murder. What we're saying is that they need to have access to ways to not get diseases and not die. I don't see why that you're trying to paint this as something else. It's really the exact same issue. Anyway, we say that this, um, these sort of things overstep the bounds of religious freedom and get directly into criminal negligence. And for those reasons, the government must step in. Not only must they step in to protect the life of the child, but they also must step in in order to sort of protect the uh, externalities of what happens when you get infectious diseases. We need to remember that before they instituted polio vaccines and things like that, polio was a pretty big deal, and people had a pretty uh, a lot of it across the country, and it was a really uh, it had a demonstrable effects on people's ability to get jobs, live happy, healthy lives, go out and be productive, feed the economy, pay taxes, social services, things like that. And when they institute polio vaccines, very few people objected, and a lot of things became much much better because of that. We've seen that with every sort of immunization that we've made mandatory, everything that we've stepped up and say, hey, you need to get these shots, you need to do these things. It's only had positive effects, and while five Five people may not like it. Five people aren't going to like every decision the government makes. That's just the way it works. That's why we have debates about these sort of things, so that these four, four instead of five cannot like it, and these four can. But we think that ultimately, in the end, we come out much, much better. Look, we are not going to deny that we're taking away the tiniest bit of religious freedom. But for that tiny bit of religious freedom, we're gaining access to a better life for these children and the chance for them to practice their own religious freedom later on in life. We think that ultimately when you balance those concerns, it weighs much more heavily in our favor. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his presentation. And now, summon the deputy leader of the opposition to the floor. which they were at fairly low risk to begin with 
from living in a country with fairly good levels of health care and so on. We don't think that actually like, these things aren't immunizations against, like, for instance, uh, widespread diseases in these countries. We don't think there's a huge medical benefit which they're getting out. We admit there is some, that's why there's a debate, but we completely object and want to make it clear that this whole life versus religion dichotomy has been falsely made. Secondly, no thank you, I know the nature of epidemiology, because is the goal of immunizing people against a communicable disease, because this is one of the points you bring up, uh, things you can pass on to your schoolmates, is the goal to get 100% compliance that everyone gets the vaccine? And the goal is that almost never 100%. The example being the government funds, for instance, uh, voluntary flu shots, things like that. These uh, measures are not only effective if everyone gets them. In fact, they're effective if only a large majority of the population gets them. And since, as they said, only a small minority would opt out, we don't think that the loss of the 2, 3, 1.7, it doesn't really matter, because people would actually have a notable deleterious effect on the level of immunizational uh, effectiveness for the entire population. I'll explain that why that is in just a second. Uh, Sarah. Okay. You're talking about old diseases. What if we had a vaccination for something like AIDS or we, something we like don't. that? New vaccinations. We no, like I'm saying if we developed it. Well, then we'll have another debate when we develop that. Like if we have a magic wand that solves things, we'll have a debate about that too later. But I'm saying that currently we don't. This is about polio, which no one's going to die anyway, because it's America. And then secondly, that even if I don't get my rubella shot, if every one of my classmates gets their rubella shot, they're still fine. You cannot communicate diseases to people who are themselves immunized. So actually, the majority of the population will still be safe. So their argument that these children are all going to die is wrong. The argument they're all going to be like typhoid Marys going around their high schools is also wrong. We think this is just completely unfair. Uh, the only disease this is sort of widely spread is probably the HPV vaccine. Most of these people aren't having a lot of unprotected sex anyway since they're religious extremists. So we think that, you know, this isn't largely speaking a relative concern. Now I'm going to talk about some things that the uh, Prime Minister brought up. Now her first point, well, mostly her model, is something with which we have some concern. The argument is that these children will be denied access to, they said, all interactions with the state which includes public education, it includes uh, healthcare uh, in jurisdictions in which that's mandated, it includes, I don't know, whatever it is the state gives to people. We have a couple of reasons why this is bad. Firstly, as was set up part of by my partner, this punishes children for decisions of their parents, which we think is unreasonable. We admit that there will be some loss of like their potential defense against like rubella when they don't get the shot, but since they're locked, their, their chance of getting rubella was pretty low. Their chance of otherwise going to high school, pretty high. So we're taking away their chance to do something they probably would have otherwise done, something which is broadly beneficial for them, which we don't think, no thank you, uh, there was actually, is a, a great enough concern. I think that's like grossly coercive, and we don't think that's reasonable. Worse yet, I can only apply that to the point that Levy brought up. What are the kind of people who are going to be opting out of this? Very small number of people, people with whom probably most of us in this room disagree. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in some cases, Christian scientists, uh, large Muslim minorities actually in many, uh, in many Western countries, not particularly this one, but they said liberal democracy, so we can talk about Poland, we can talk about the United Kingdom. We think that in, these, in this kind of context, the sort of populations that opt out are the kinds that already felt themselves being very excluded. Now, yes, they felt themselves excluded to a certain extent. But we think one of the best ways of fixing that is making sure they go to school with everybody else, making sure that they have some kind of involvement in the general John. political process. We think that telling a uh, percentage of your population, which might be, which might be five or it might be you know, whatever it is, telling them that they can't be involved and that the state is trying to coerce them is a very bad political signal. Not merely for the ideological uh, sort of position that's mean, but it has practical effects on having these people you know, feel like they're involved, feel like they can contribute to society beneficially, we think that there are strong uh, political downsides to this kind of plan. Even if you thought this was a reasonable thing to do, this is clearly too hard a plan sure. to try to address it. No. But, but how far does this actually go? How far does the exception go in terms of how a person can treat their child on religious grounds except to still be allowed to incorporate themselves into society? Well, I think they probably can't beat the kid. They can't do something that's like perceptively and entirely foreseeably going to hurt them. This is the thing with the kids playing with snakes or what have you. Like, the chance of that of the snake biting you very, very high. The chance of you getting polio in your regular life in San Francisco is fairly low. So I think that there is obviously some kind of cutoff. We're, we're willing to accept that. But I think that I've established in our point that the, the things from which people were being protected was, were fairly unlikely anyway, and the damage or the increased risk this has to themselves and to society in general is fairly low. If Sarah's AIDS vaccine comes up anytime soon, we'll renegotiate because I think that would be fairly concerning. But that isn't the case currently. We're talking about uh, diseases for which they warranted a very, very high, high risk. So we think that there is some right of parents to do things which are harmful to their children. We find that the parents can smoke when their children around, which is obviously much more harmful in many cases because they might get lung cancer. Parents can give their children bad food or drive them or not let them walk. We simply do allow children to make that. And I think I'm going to apply that to Levy's first point when he said that parents are allowed to be sort of the regents of their children's sovereignty at a time when we don't think they can make reasonable decisions for themselves. And that includes allowing them to make decisions which, in our greater wisdom, we, with which we might disagree. We think you have to allow that because there simply isn't a feasible alternative to allowing parents to have 
some level of importance over their parent, over their children at this point. They make decisions in their children's best interest, and we point out that in many cases, the children themselves might not want this vaccine, might not uh, sort of understand the concept of it, and it might have very negative, very strong downsides towards them. So, no, thank you. I think that there is actually a strong concern. So the point that Levy brought up was firstly on the political dimensions, and we don't think this was ever really addressed. We think these people do have a right to sort of uh, their, their freedom of expression, their freedom of belief, but worse yet, you do actually cause uh, tangible harms to them and to society in general when you entirely get rid of a certain percentage of the population. You remove them from uh, social services, like you worry about children's health care. Next time they get sick, they aren't going to the public health care system, you just excluded them from it. So like the, the horrible thing is actually if they do get rubella, they'll end die because you didn't let them go to the hospital, which I think is like conceivably much, much worse. But in many cases, even if they get other diseases, even if they want to go to a daycare because their parents both work, like there are many other harms which we think are tangibly much more impressive than the diseases from which you are trying to protect these children and much more guaranteed because you're saying you're going to do it. Also, we think that uh, when Levy talked about rights, people do have religious rights to make decisions with which you disagree. We don't let them like beat children, we don't let them satanize them or what have you. And I think that's a fairly high level that isn't really comparable. We aren't living in a plague situation in which this would be a medical uh, emergency of that sort. So we think that the kind of analogies that have simply been overblown, dramatic, and absurd. So I've talked about also the epidemiological benefits of this, how we do actually have mar a large protection for society as a whole and for these children, even without the shot. This simply is too high a cost to pay for a very marginal medical, medical benefit. And that's why we strongly say it. Thank the gentleman for his remarks. And now I call upon the second government team and their member to address the House. Okay, thanks, Mr. Speaker. I actually want to refute most of Ashbourne's speech first, and then I'm going to get into my second. Because although he can pronounce epidemiology like really, really well, uh, a lot of his arguments were wrong. So first of all, he said, like, the risk of this stuff is low. And I will, like, I will concede that it is somewhat, like, it is, it is somewhat lowish. Like, like I'll, I'll grant you that. But it is a lot of, it's like, some of these diseases that we, we immunize for are one of the big reasons we push the vaccine so much is once you get it, you know, the, the cat is kind of out of the bag, and it is, it is somewhat difficult to treat. Some of them are easy to treat, but some are really, really hard to treat. And I think, like the on a cost-benefit analysis, even if the probability is low, like the damage that is done to you is really, really, really high. And like being sick sucks. And like that's the first thing I want to say. But secondly, is John said, well, look, as long as most people have it, uh, most people have this immunization, uh, we're fine. So if only 1.7 percent of the population doesn't get it, there's not going to be wrong. Here's the thing you understand is the type of people who um, who get this, uh, who, who opt out of the situation, who are in the 1.7%, are not evenly distributed among the entire population, Mr. Speaker. When you look at the, the anatomy of epidemics, these people are clustered. They all live in the same place, i.e. like the Muslim community in London or something like that. It's very, very highly clustered. You have large numbers of people, so you have a small community or like a strange religious community in the South or something like that, like, like that sort of community. So you have that cluster where instead of 1.7% of the people not having the, the vaccine, you have 90% of the people who don't have the vaccine. And then you combine, and this is the best part, is you combine immigrant communities with like bad ideas about health with like travel to foreign countries where they're from with lots of diseases that they're now not immunized for. And then they, one guy goes to Pakistan and comes back and everybody dies. So like like I think this is this is this is how epidemics happen, right? Like that scenario is the disaster scenario. That is why we vaccinate. Even if there's only a small chance of that happening, <laughs> like like I, I think it's worth taking precautions for. Go. Okay, so the cluster all get sick. Tell me why it's good that none of them get to go to a hospital at that point. <laughs> I don't think we're denying like like people basic emergency care. Like like, like no no like like like, like this the, like this is a real thing. Like there's certain vaccines you like can't go to school and like can't get a social insurance card. I think these are reasonable these are reasonable measures. We're not throwing people in jail. I think you're I think you're you're blowing this massively out of proportion. Uh, okay. Also I want to talk a little bit quickly about mutation and the way mutation happens. So if everyone in society, like hundred percent, is vaccinated against it, then no one in the society has it. Diseases can't mutate if they don't exist. 
right? So like the big fear is like like some kind of like radical, very very like cool and deadly form of diphtheria that like randomly forms. So if there's even if there's a few people floating around with these diseases, the odds of a mutation go higher. And now your vaccine that everyone has doesn't count for anything. So there is value in eliminating a disease in society Sorry. instead of just like having it be very 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 low prevalence, right? There, the elimination is a good thing in itself, and that's the goal of all these vaccination programs. So I think I think I understand epidemiology better with the epidemic guys. This is this is their whole thing: mutations and clusters are like the two big problems. And John missed both of those. Sir, let's then talk about proxy consent because that's what this rounds it up. So so I want to make two simple points and then some more sophisticated points. So first of all, I want to say like I think proxy consent. This is my extension, by the way. Proxy consent is is like what we like we let parents make decisions for their kids. I feel like in 95, 99.9% .9 of cases, actually, this is a very useful way of making these decisions. That's the first thing I'd say. But obviously, as we've said, you know, there's certain decisions, child abuse, and lots of other things that I'm going to be talking about, where we overrule proxy consent. The second thing I want to quickly say is not vaccinating your kid, I think, is a bad idea. I think in general, like, we realize that I agree is like a reasonable thing to do. So I just wanted to say that. So now the question becomes. We have agreed as a society to limit proxy consent for everybody who's not religious, right? We said, like, if you don't have a good reason, your kid's getting vaccinated. So the question is, when is religion a good enough reason to override limits that we're placing on parental control of your children? And my answer is only when there's really no harm. So Levy brought up circumcision. I think circumcision is an example where there's like there is like there is no harm. It does, like it, nothing happens. Like it, it's, it's fine. Uh, so we like we, we feel like that's that's it, like an entirely reasonable for things people for religious reasons to want to do. Uh, so like we have this general prohibition on like doing unnecessary medical procedures or like the harm to children. But like there's, there's a religious exemption here, so that's fine. But there are lots of other cases where the harms are like actual where we don't allow this. One example would be female genitalia mutilation, right? This is a really big deal in a lot of cultures. We don't allow this. I think this is 100% analogous to this case. I think another really analogous uh, situation is like allowing marriage at a really, really young age for religious reasons, right? Like, like, like uh, you know, marrying someone off when they're 12 or something like that. We think that that's, that's a really bad idea in society. We don't allow non-religious people to do it. And even though religious people have a better reason to do it, we still don't allow them to do it. We restrict religious rights, we restrict parental rights when the, like, the body rights and the harm of the child are substantially larger. The third example I'm going to give you, which I think is really interesting, this isn't a religious exemption, it's like a philosophical thing, is like allowing deaf parents to engineer deaf children. We don't allow that. So, so even if you're like philosophically uncomfortable with immunization, or think your child should be like pure in a certain way, I don't like, we, we don't buy that argument either. Okay. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's entirely reasonable. And the last thing I would kind of say on this note is there's really no such thing as like, a, this is kind of the Christopher Hitchens argument, there's really no such thing as a Muslim child. You're a child, or like, a, like a Christian child or a child of any particular religion. Because you're a child. You really, like, you, it's kind of a false consciousness thing. This has kind of been, been put into you. So all these arguments, like, maybe the kid doesn't want to get the immunization, and, like, his parents are just doing this because that's what he doesn't want. I don't buy that ar argumentation either. Uh, like, I, I, I think it's entirely reasonable to say that, that decisions for that kid, when they are life and death decisions, should not include a religious component. I just, I just like, I, I like religion, but I like life substantially more. So I think we've given you some really interesting examples. I think we, when we make proxy consent limits for everybody, uh, when, when they're about life and death, we should make them for everybody. And I also think I explained to you uh, how epidemics actually happen. Clustering, mutation, that's why we immunize. So for those reasons, we propose. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for his remarks, and now invite the <coughs> member of the opposition to address this August body. Well, 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've heard a very interesting argument extended from the government on this idea of proxy consent. And we think that's something which does need to be extended on this debate today. As we want to tell you exactly what those standards should be. Because he told us today, you know, the government doesn't always just agree that parents have consents, that religions can do what they want. And we agree. But he didn't then give us any standards for when they overrule that. So this side of the House today, that's what we're going to extend on. We're going to provide you with very clear standards for why the government does sometimes overrule parental consent, when it does so, and why it is not applicable in this case. So what we see, first of all, he said, you know, here's, he had this idea, he said, we sometimes overrule consent. And he pointed, you know, for instance, things like child abuse. And we say, yes, you do overrule it in the case of child abuse. And you do that for one of two, you, you, you have basically two fundamental standards that the government applies. Well, the first one is the idea of direct, severe harm to a specific child. That's why child abuse, why genital mutilation, why forced marriages, why all these direct, severe, inflicted harm, and thank you, sir, that he talked about are banned by the government. We said there's a second one, the idea of a huge social cost, insofar as you're worried about a disease mutating. And we'll be extending on this idea as well of epidemiology and how we think that it's important, and no, thank you, madam, to consider the fact that these disease mutations aren't occurring in Western communities, and, and indeed the way that at the margin we don't think it's going to be more occurring. But we say that bearing in mind these two standards, the government works on a fundamental presumption, a fundamental presumption that it is not its role to judge the good life, that the government has a role to judge and to protect life itself, and that that role should be upheld within the parental contract insofar as you don't allow these direct, severe harms. But that beyond that, a government in a Western, secular, liberal society, which is what is at stake in this debate today, has absolutely no place interfering in the private lives of homes or communities in assessing what is the proper lifestyle or mode of life to live. We say insofar as they do so, they deny the very nature of liberalism itself because they deny the nature of people's ability to make a choice for themselves. Now this is directly applicable to adults when we consider that we wouldn't intrude on religious observances when these religious observances don't have these clear directs of our heart. But we say that it's equally important, no thank you, in the case of children. But we think that a government can make a fair presumption that children will follow for at least the first 18 years of their life in the same religious pattern as their parents, and as such, that that pattern and that society does need to be protected, and that the children, in lieu of being able to make those decisions for themselves autonomously, have their parents to make those decisions for them. We say the very basis of secularism and the very basis of liberalism is that the government doesn't interfere with those decisions insofar as those decisions don't hugely affect others adversely. So let's then look, let's then look with that in mind, at this potential of how this could affect others diversely. Because the first thing they told you is that there's this huge social cost of the disease spreading. And we heard this idea of clusters coming up from the government speaking. He said, look at a Muslim community in London. He said, of course, you know, it, it's not a case of polio spreading all across America. It's not a case of, you know, having 95% you know, uh, protection across America. It's a case of this one Muslim community where no one gets vaccinated. And we say, first of all, we reject that. Because we think that within every community, there are people who hold different strands of beliefs. And we don't think you're going to see every Muslim in London not getting immunized. We think you're going to see a small portion of those Muslims within that community not being immunized. We don't think a tipping point is going to be reached even within that community. We say, secondly, though, if a tipping point is reached within that community, we think that from a philosophical perspective, this is fundamentally better than it being reached in the nation at large. Insofar as these people have made a consenting choice to opt out of the system, we think that they can expect, in a liberal society, they should indeed have to put up with the costs of that decision. And we have no problems with that. I'll accept you, madam. Okay, can the opposition please explain how making a child be subjected to immunization or influenza year after year after year because they don't get immunizations is not child abuse? Certainly, we can explain how that isn't child abuse, madam, because we think right now you allow parents to smack their children. We think you allow them to have homeschooling, which is a worse education. We think you allow parents to force their children to wear headscarves. We think you allow parents to do all sorts of things to children that cause them to be socially ostracized or in some way slightly physically harmed or have a risk thereof. The government doesn't step in. The definition of child abuse is direct severe harm, our standard in this debate. We say that's not when the government steps in. We say, however, that what would be abusive in this situation would be a denial of the positive rights the government can provide. Because government in a free and liberal society doesn't just provide negative rights, freedom from child abuse, it also provides
positive rights. And we think that the model that they set up on this side of the house today fundamentally neglects all of those positive rights. Because the children who are knocked out of the system, and we think that we've done a great analysis from first government, from first opposition rather today, showing that children will be kicked out of the system. Because when parents have to decide whether their children should go to hell or just not be able to opt into the public system, they're ultimately going to decide to opt out of the public system because it seems a lot nicer than going to hell. We say that when that's the case, that you're denying these people their positive rights as part of this society. We say you're denying them the basis of an education within this society. We say you're denying them the basis of health care within this society. You're denying them the basis of social integration within this society. We think these positive rights are very important because the people's expression, their very political involvement within society, depends on these political right, positive rights being fulfilled. Insofar as they don't have an adequate education because they've been kicked out of the mainstream system, we don't think they have a voice in politics. I accept you, sir. Okay, I want to go way back to the beginning of your speech. You said I didn't give you a standard. The standard I gave you was risk of substantial bodily harm. The bodily harm that exists if you get like a mutated strain of diphtheria that doesn't exist if you get circumcised. Well, so if the standard was risk of substantial bodily harm, we would close every playground in the country. The fact of the matter is the government doesn't step in every time there's a risk. It steps in where there is harm. We say, insofar as your standard throughout this debate mm. has been a nebulous risk, which we believe, again, First Opposition very clearly showed, was a 0.1% risk because polio is isolated to a bunch of jungles in northern Nigeria. We said, as that's your risk, then you should also have to put up UFO screens over every house in the country in case the impending invasion happens. We don't think that's the way the government works. It doesn't work off weird nebulous risks when there's a far greater present and imminent threat here of these people being cut out of the system. Indeed, when your model guarantees these people will be cut out of the system. On this side of the house today, they present you with the 0.1% chance of a weird tropical disease. This side of the house today, we tell you that that will give you a 100% chance of disenfranchisement of large minorities. On this ground, we're proud to oppose. I thank the member of the opposition for his comments. And now I call upon the government whip to conclude this debate for her side of the bench. Here, here. of what was given to us as an extension from the second opposition. So what did they say? They talked to you about the proxy consent and um, standard and what it should be. And basically they didn't really give you a lot. They basically said parents need to have the ability to do these things. That we don't mandate eliminating risk for your children. That risk is okay. You're allowed to let your kid risk their lives. And they made this crazy analogy of playgrounds and how there's risks there. Yes, we say there's risks in a playground. But the way we actually mitigate risks like those is if you're a parent who's absolutely ridiculous and lets your kid go to the playground and play with knives that they find on the street by themselves, child services comes and takes that child away. We want parents to be able to monitor their children. That's the same sort of thing, that kind of negligence about putting your kids in harm's way. We recognize there's risk with everything. It's balancing the risk to your child, how great the harm is, and the risk to the rest of the community. So what I'd like to say is, for example, there is a possibility that if you undergo FGM, that you will like it as an adult, that you will think it was a good thing, and that you won't have had an infection from that procedure. But there is a significant risk that you will feel violated and that you will be harmed by the procedure, which is why we don't allow it. Similarly, there is a risk if I contract polio that I will never be able to use my hand again. There is a risk that I will be sick for the rest of, I will be very sick when it happens, and there is a risk I might die. This is a very bad risk. There's a high likelihood if I were to catch polio oh, that this would happen to me. So I don't care if it's unlikely that I'll catch polio. My parents should make damn well sure they sh I don't because there's ability to make sure that I never do and to make sure that this disease doesn't mutate and that other people can't catch it from me. Yes, I'll take you. Yes, and there's an absolute guarantee under your plan of violating religious and parental rights. Religious groups like these aren't going away. There's a lot of issues that we care about. Why was there political capital alienating and ghettoizing all of these people by denying them access to all services? Okay, this will actually take me into my into um, my summary. So first of all, is it an effective method? Is this actually effective? Will people do this or will we just get a lies? Everyone is the first question. The Toronto District School Board in Canada actually has this exact policy. You cannot go to school, to kindergarten, unless you have a vaccination for things like polio and diphtheria and all of those things when you are a child, when you are four years old. 
Almost everyone does it, Mr. Speaker. Why? Because people realize at the end of the day that it's out of their control, so God probably won't see it as a sin, and because it is the only way they can, in many ways, survive. Your kid can't survive without an education, and you certainly can't survive without a social security number. You could never get a job. So it is coercive. We're recognizing it's coercive and that people are coerced into doing this, that everyone will. But furthermore, we think in certain cases, it is okay to use government coercion. If you use female genitalia mutilation on your daughter, we will use government coercion to convince you that it's wrong by taking that child away and probably taking away younger children who have been headed away from you, so you can never do that to them. That is what we do in Canada. That has actually happened when we took a seven-year-old girl away from her parents because they, served, they did mutilation on her nine-year-old girl. It happened in Ontario last year. We think that we do these things when there is a risk. We think that it's worthwhile when there are these risks, Mr. Speaker, and we think it's okay because there's certain religious beliefs that are so, so, that there's certain religious beliefs that have so many, are pregnant with so many implications that this is fine. This also brings us to this idea of, is it this an appropriate abrogation of parental rights, which is a really important thing. Proxy consent is what really this back half debate came down to. Is this an appropriate idea for proxy consent? And Robert told you in his speech, which was never engaged with by the second half, that children cannot be Muslims, children cannot be Jehovah's Witnesses, because they haven't actually developed this capability. That's the Christopher Hitchens argument, right? It's parents who think these children should be that way, who are trying to socialize their children into adopting these values, but the children haven't. But what do you do when you put your kid at greater risk of contracting like something like polio and possibly dying from it or having any <coughs> lots of severe sort of disabilities throughout their life is you limit the potentiality of this child based on a religion that you yourself believe in but they don't believe in yet. We think it's never okay to limit the potentiality of your child, the ability of your child to use that hand or to live and be healthy for religion you subscribe to but your children yet, child yet is not 18 and has not made that abil has not made that conformed decision to subscribe to. We don't limit this ability with adults because, well we do sometimes, they say we can't do this to their kids, but because they actually have informed consent. Children in society recognize have different levels of consent. So if I'm a kid and I'm being abused by my dad, I can't say I really like it. But if I'm a woman and I'm being abused by my husband, I can say I really like it and they won't take me away. That's different. We allow adults to make these decisions, not children. We said that children are not allowed to. So is this an appropriate a situation for proxy consent. Robert told you there's a difference between things like circumcision, which first off talked to you about, which is very superficial and doesn't affect other people, and things like disease control. So Robert really told you about the idea of the cluster factor and this kind of mutation which could actually occur, which is really important to epidemiology. And this is sort of brushed off. They said it's their right to opt out of this part of the social contract. It's their right to ghettoize themselves in these communities and to decide that we don't want these vaccines. Now, Robert, so I actually don't think that that's necessarily true because these children did not necessarily sign on to this. These children were too young to understand the implications of getting something like polio when you're six years old. We think the state has an obligation to protect these children from having something that could affect the rest of their lives so significantly, which is why it's different from circumcision, when you can still get an erection if you were circumcised, when you can still do everything with the penis that you could normally do with the penis if it weren't circumcised. This is an actual distinct difference. The risks are very, very great. It's possible I could get polio and be fine, but it's possible that I couldn't. The other thing is just, this is public health money that is going to be wasted. This is public health money and the possibility of a mutation. And the only way to get rid of a disease is to make sure everyone doesn't have the disease with the vaccination. That's how you eliminate the vaccination. That's how you eliminate it. We think we understand epidemiology better. We don't think you can just opt out of that because that's not fair to the rest of the people in society that they could interact with. And it's not fair to these children in this community. They sort of brushed off the idea that there might be large groups of people who don't want these immunizations. We think even if 30% of the Muslim community in Britain opts out of this, that's enough for an epidemic that costs a lot of money and a lot of lives for these children. Why would we sacrifice these children because of what their parents believe when many times Sometimes children even don't believe in what their parents believe in when they grow up and adopt different religious norms. You're denying them the opportunity to actually do that in many ways by saying you will always be scarred by the religion your parents actually believe in. So what's best for kids and for society? Robert told you about epidemics and how they start, how you just need a few people who aren't vaccinated. And that's why in places like Toronto, we vaccinate everyone. We say this coercive authority works. It works in Toronto where you do have the elimination of these diseases and immigrant communities like the Muslim community still do do it. And they still move to Toronto in droves, Mr. Speaker, because at the end of the day, it is coercive, but it's not the be all and end all. You don't feel a lot of people opting out. They say, why are you punishing the kids? It's a rights balancing thing. In the end, I'm not punishing them. I'm saying you need to, we're saying you need to get this, and if you don't, we're not going to let you hurt other people by being exposed to them 
them by getting mutation of a disease that you, they could contract from you and you could hurt other people's children. It's rights balancing. Other people who are vaccinated could still be hurt by that mutation. At the end of the day, we do what's best for children. We do what's best for society. We do what's best for disease control. Thank you. I thank the lady for her consensual whipping, and now I call on the opposition whip to show his style. <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about this idea of the risk that's actually involved, because we think it's being kind of distorted all the way down this opposition line. And then I'm going to talk about this kind of thorny debate that we've had about consent and when parents and when the government gets to make decisions about children. The two basic So this idea of risk, we think it's very, very important and something that hasn't really been addressed by the proposition side, that there's actually a huge difference between moving a population from 70% to 80% coverage and moving from 95 to 99% coverage. Because it doesn't scale really in terms of the harms and the costs and the benefits that are involved. We said that there actually is a tipping point involved in epidemiological concerns. So if you've got like 75% coverage in terms of flu shots or whatever, then your population is basically safe. And if you drop below that, then your population in trouble. But once you're above that threshold, which we are in just about every case that's being debated here, you're okay. <coughs> there is very, very little marginal benefit from moving from 82% to 85%. No, thank you. That's something that's really being missed. Because what we have right now in the status quo is a system whereby we generally do allow these religious and philosophical opt-outs, and it's working pretty well, because there aren't enough religious people involved to actually move our population below that tipping point, to actually involve that very, very serious harm, that actual risk <coughs> of mutation and death that they're talking about. So that's something quite important, but they aren't actually making a, a large marginal difference. We think they're making a very large marginal cost, I'll move on to that in a minute. They talk to you about epidemics and clusters that they're really worried about. <coughs> we say a couple of things. We said in a, in a religious, uh, in a secular society, in a secular society, when the cluster is consenting to take that risk, we're generally okay with them getting the flu or measles or whatever. That's fine. Second of all, we say, no thank you. The way this actually works is that you don't have hermetically sealed religious communities. <coughs> Everybody interacts with people who aren't as fanatically religious as them on a daily basis. That's just the way society works. So in terms of coverage, you have, no thank you, some small clusters, but that's not enough to actually make the difference and move you beyond the tipping point. That's something very important. But more importantly than that, is that these clusters are generally too small. The people who actually care about this so much that they would refuse vaccination one we think would also refuse schooling and healthcare from the state, which is a very large problem that they didn't address. But we think there are very, very few people. So these clusters are quite small, and they don't lead to vast epidemics in the whole population. Then to talk about children who are part of these clusters but didn't consent. We are talking about measles vaccines, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about flu shots. And if it worked in Toronto, maybe that's because Toronto's religious profile isn't the same as that of lots of parts of the United States. We think that's very important. We think, no thank you, that they also tell you that even in Toronto, people did opt out. That's very important. That's very problematic for their side of the house. Sorry. No. The next thing they talk about is mutations, that we're really worried that measles will take hold in some small part of rural Georgia, and that it will spread and kill us all somehow. Like, no. The actual worry that we have about mutations, and it's a very severe worry, is from travel. Because polio still exists in the jungles in northern Nigeria, and we let parents take their children there on holidays if they want to. No thank you. That's the risk. Like, poor sanitary conditions in chicken farms in Guangdong province are where we're actually worried about diseases mutating. Not in terms of people who don't get flu shots in Tennessee. No thank you. So they've blown the epidemiology out of proportion. And they've also misunderstood the scaling effects that are involved. The actual marginal benefit of moving up the population's coverage rate from about 97% to maybe 98 or 
is incredibly, vanishingly small. So what's the trade-off? On that point, sir. No. Second big area of clash. What's the trade-off? We think there's a very, very large rights trade-off, and we think it's something that they've ignored. They talked to a they talk to you a lot about when the state can intervene to stop parents doing things to children, like female genital mutilation, like uh, child abuse. And we say, yeah, the state should probably intervene to stop those things, because that meets our standard of direct, severe harm to the child in question. But with vaccinations and immunology, we're talking about indirect, mild harm at the level of the population, not the individual child. That's a very large difference. And that's something that we're not willing to violate parental rights over. I, I mean, okay, the thing is that the low risk that we're talking about is due primarily to the little protested programs like this. And this new piece of analysis about scaling, the only risk of dropping down are these opt-outs. We're closing that loophole. We think that that's a good thing. Why should we leave this open so it can drop down by no, your no. own analysis? The from only that risk, risk of dropping down is if there were like 20 times more religious people in the country than there are. We're nowhere near the level where this could conceivably be a problem. That's why the status quo works. We're okay as we are. Like, yes, if they evangelize incredibly successfully and suddenly our population is vulnerable to this super flu that's going to kill us all, we might renegotiate. But there is no real danger involved in the actual debate we're having. What we're talking about is the comfort of the children, not their lives. Okay, that being the case, we think that rights maximization is generally we think that when you force these children to get their vaccinations or choose between vaccinations and not going to school, you're violating their rights. But you're also violating their future rights. We think it's going to impact their ability to engage meaningfully in this odd religious belief that they've got that vaccinations are evil. And we might not share that belief, but we think we should probably respect that belief. And if having a vaccine as a child affects your ability later in life to be a devout and practicing member of that sect, that's a very real harm to you, and that's all the justification you need in terms of cost-benefit analysis. Lots of people in this debate are comfortable saying they should get the immunization, but we don't think that a secular state should be comfortable saying that. We think a secular state should be comfortable saying that actually this is a very important personal decision that you should make for yourself because it does impact your religious beliefs, and the state isn't going to say that you're wrong about that, that you're not going to hell, that it's more important that you get the flu shot. That's not a decision that we're in a position to make for these people, and we think that it's very important to preserve their ability, just because the child might not be Muslim in their Christopher Hitchens phrase, if they're raised by Muslims and very, very likely to be Muslims, and making them get the shot makes it more difficult for them to be Muslims later on, that's a very severe harm, and we oppose it. I thank all the speakers for the excellent points they made and an excellent tournament that they participated in. I invite them all to cross the aisle and congratulate each other. Um, and then I guess you're supposed to go dress up. Thank <laughs> you.